بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى جميع إخوانه من النبيين والمرسلين وآل كل وصحب كل ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and protect his nation from that which he fears for them. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, let us first have the proper intention in our hearts to attend the lesson for the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Insha'Allah, starting from tonight, we'll have a series of lessons highlighting the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then we talk about commemorating the birth of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam annually known as Al-Mawlid. Many are unaware of the biography of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his life, his lineage. So we decided to talk about this topic to make sure that every one of you is aware of this magnificent biography of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born in the when a non-believer called Abraha attacked the Kaaba. Before he entered Mecca, Allah destroyed Abraha and his army that was headed by a large elephant. Allah sent birds which carried three stones, one in its beak and two in its claws. The birds dropped those stones on the army of Abraha. Each stone would enter the head of a soldier of this army and exit from the lower part of his body. It was also mentioned that every stone had the name of the soldier it's going to hit. It is said that 60,000 soldiers were killed, those who came to destroy the Kaaba. This year was known as the year of the elephant, around 570 from the Roman calendar. That's why the year when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born was known as the year of the elephant, Ta'amul Fil. So the Prophet was born in the year of the elephant, marking that event that took place when Abraha and his army were destroyed. Abraha who was a king on part of Yemen, assigned by the king of Abyssinia at that time, heard about the Arabs coming from different regions of the Arabic Peninsula each year for Hajj to the Kaaba. Although most of them were non-believers, but this is one of the leftover practices 
that they had since the time of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, who rebuilt the Kaaba with his son Ismail, Ishmael. They built the Kaaba. Allah Azza wa Jal revealed to Prophet Ibrahim to proclaim to people to come and perform Hajj. And he exclaimed, how would my voice reach people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him that you make the announcement, you proclaim, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his voice reach people east and west. So Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam proclaimed and he said, O oh people, come and perform Hajj. It was mentioned that those who were in the womb of their mothers heard that voice. And those who were still in the back of their fathers were able to hear that voice. The scholars said everyone for whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed to perform hajj till the day of judgment heard that voice of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and answered it by saying labbaik Allahumma labbaik so people started coming from different regions to perform hajj every year in that season that king of Yemen was annoyed about the fact that people from different parts of the Arabic Peninsula are heading towards Mecca every year. He said, I'll build a place that is way nicer than the Kaaba and I'll make people come to my place instead. He spent a lot of money decorating a place that was called al qulais decorated it with gold and the like and he was expecting people to shift from visiting the Kaaba every year to visiting this place that he built in Yemen one of the Arabs from Mecca was so annoyed about this matter he was very upset with this king of Yemen and about his plan to deter people from visiting the Kaaba. So he went to that place that this king built and tried to do something inside kind of destruction and the like to show that he is upset with this try from this king of Yemen to deter people from visiting the Kaaba. He threw some waste inside, vandalized the place in a way, then he left. When that king of Yemen he knew about this matter that a person from Mecca did such and such to his place he said I'll lead an army to destroy the Kaaba he led an army of 60,000 soldiers and he took with him the elephant until he reached the boundaries of Mecca he found some camels grazing outside the outskirts of Mecca and he took them, confiscated all of them. And they belonged to Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then Abdul Muttalib went to this person, Abraha, to talk to him. Abraha welcomed Abdul Muttalib 
honored him, made him sit next to him to talk to him. Then he said, what are you after? Abdul Muttalib said, I came to you because I heard that you have taken 200 camels that belong to me and I want them back. Abraha said to him through the, the interpreter, he said to him, when you first came to me from the tribe of Quraysh, a senior member, I honored you and glorified you. But once I knew that you are asking about 200 camels that I have taken from you and not being worried about the Kaaba that I'm coming to destroy, which is part of your religion, that matter degraded you in my eyes. Abdul Muttalib said to him, I'm the owner of these camels and I'm supposed to protect them. And the Kaaba has an owner and that is the Lord and the Lord will protect it. He gave him his camels, he went back to Mecca and he told them about what Abraha is intending to do. Then he asked people to spread in the streets of Mecca to go to the mountains so they won't be harmed. And he said to them, he's coming with a great army that we cannot fight them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will protect this place. And if he were to be destroyed by Allah Azza wa Jal, then we watch. Because if we were to choose to fight him and his army, we won't be able to. They left Abraha headed towards Kaaba. He directed the elephant to the Kaaba and pushed it to walk towards Kaaba, but the elephant sat in its place. He tried to hit it so it can get up and run towards Kaaba, but the elephant refused. He asked them to direct the elephant back to Yemen, where he came from. It got up and started running. He then asked them to direct it to Asham. It ran towards Asham in that direction. Then he turned it back towards Kaaba. It sat in its, in its place. He knew from this that there is something. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the birds, as Allah mentioned in the Quran, Tayran Ababil from the side of the sea. Every bird was carrying three stones, just as smaller than a chickpea. But the name of everyone in the army was written on it. So every stone was dedicated to a specific person in that army. The bird was carrying three, one in its beak, two in its claws. And they threw these stones on his army and they were destroyed. His advisor, known as Abu Yaksum, fled the place and went to the king of Abyssinia to tell him about what happened to his army that came to destroy the Kaaba. A bird followed this advisor from Mecca to Abyssinia waiting till this advisor reached 
the king of Abyssinia and tell him about what happened. Once he finished his story about what happened, that bird threw that stone at him and killed him. This event was in the same year when the Prophet ﷺ was born. That's why it was known as the year of the elephant. Allah Ta'ala said, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ Meaning, O oh Muhammad, haven't you heard about what Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala did to the people of the elephant? and how they were destroyed. The father of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was called Abdullah, who was the son of Abdul Muttalib, the owner of the 200 camels that we mentioned about earlier. And his mother was Amina. It is mentioned that Abdullah, the father of the Prophet, died when he was in Medina at the age of about 25 or 28 and around three months before the Prophet ﷺ was born. So the Prophet was born as an orphan. Prophet Muhammad was born in the house of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, close to as Safa, in an area in Mecca called Suq al-Layl. Now there is a library in that place where the Prophet ﷺ was born. That was on Monday at treasure time, in the morning, at dawn. And it was said that it was after the passing of 12 nights of Rabi'ul Awwal. In the month of Rabi'ul Awwal, in the 12th night of Rabi'ul Awwal. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the son of Abdullah. Abdullah is the son of Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, the son of Hashim. Hashim is the son of Abdul Manaf, the son of Qusay, the son of Kilab, the son of Murra, the son of Kaab, the son of Lu'ay, the son of Ghalib, the son of Fihr, who was also known as Quraysh. The son of Malik, the son of An-Nadr, the son of Kinana, the son of Khuzayma, the son of Mudrika, the son of Ilyas, the son of Mudar, the son of Nizar, the son of Ma'ad, the son of Adnan. This lineage that I have mentioned is confirmed. The scholars confirm the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from his father Abdullah up to Adnan. That's the great great grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From Adnan the lineage goes back to Ishmael the son of Prophet Abraham, Prophet Ibrahim Alayhi Salam. Prophet Abraham had two sons Isaac and Ishmael. From Isaac came Jacob, who was also known as Israel. Israel. Israel is the name of Jacob. Jacob also had Yusuf and his brothers. Then from the descendants came the prophets of the children of Israel. So all the prophets came from Isaac, the son of Abraham. From Ishmael, only one prophet came, and that is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
So from Adnan, the great grandfather, to Ishmael, to Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, there is a difference amongst the scholars of Islam about the order of the fathers. But what is confirmed and authenticated is from the Prophet till Adnan, that great grandfather. Then from Ibrahim alayhi salam, the lineage goes back to Sam, the son of Prophet Noah, Nuh. And from Prophet Nuh to Prophet Adam alayhim as salatu was Throughout the whole lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was none at all that is classified as illegitimate relationship. Rather, it was all in marriage, proper, valid marriage. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I was born from a proper, valid marriage throughout my lineage. So there was no fornication at any time in his whole lineage back to Prophet Adam alayhi salam. His mother is Amina bint Wahb ibn Abdi Manaf ibn Zuhra ibn Kilab ibn Murra and they meet again at Kilab ibn Murrah in the same lineage. She was a pious Muslim, pious believer. The scholars of Islam said that the parents of the Prophet wasallam, the minimum to say about them that they are saved in the hereafter and that they are going to be in paradise. Because the least to say is that they haven't heard the call of the Prophet وسلم, and consequently they won't be accountable and they will be saved, they will be in paradise on the day for judgment. However, other scholars said that they might have been on the religion of Prophet Jesus, which was a religion of Islam, worshipping Allah alone without associating partners with him. They might have been on the religion of Jesus. And they might have been inspired with the proper belief to worship Allah alone and not to associate partners with him. So the least to say about them that they are saved in the hereafter they will be in paradise. That's the minimum to say about them that they're going to be saved in the hereafter and they are going to be in paradise. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had several nurses that nursed the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam among them Suwayba and Halima. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had many brothers through breastfeeding. Among them was Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, that's his uncle. So the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam breastfed with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he was you know, nursed by same breastfeeding woman. So there were brothers in breastfeeding. Masruh ibn Suwayba, that's another one, and Abdullah ibn al Haris, the son of Halima. So he had these brothers through breastfeeding. It was mentioned that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the 12 paternal uncles all of whom were non-Muslims except for Al-Abbas and Hamza. So out of all of them, only Al-Abbas and Hamza embraced Islam. And he had six paternal aunts as well, of whom it is only confirmed 
that Safiya embraced Islam. That's his aunt, Safiya. And some added Atika as well. The Prophet وسلم, had many first cousins, among whom were Ali ibn Abi Talib and Ja'far, Abdullah and Al Fadl, the sons of Al Abbas, and Al Zubayr ibn Al Awwam, who was the son of Safiya as well. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had three sons and four daughters. The sons were Al Qasim, and he was born before the Prophet received the revelation. Died at the age of two. Abdullah, who was called Al Tayyib, and Al Tahir, and Ibrahim, who was born in Medina, and died when he was only 18 months. And the Prophet وسلم, when he was farewelling his son Ibrahim, it was mentioned that he was crying. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, the great companion, looked at the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, even you cry as we do. The Prophet وسلم, answered, This is a mercy, O son of Auf. Then he said, The eyes might shed tears. The heart might ache, but we never say something that is against the religion. We say only what is accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. Although we are struck with grief for the loss of Ibrahim. And this is a lesson for all of us. To learn from the Prophet والسلام, that he was inflicted with calamities in this life. All his children passed away during his lifetime except for his daughter Fatima who died shortly after the death of the Prophet But all his children, three sons and three daughters died during his lifetime and he remained patient and he said what I have mentioned earlier when he was farewelling his son Ibrahim who was less than two years old he said the eyes might shed tears the heart might ache and we are struck with grief for the loss of Ibrahim but we never say except what is accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. So the Prophet said, we never say except what is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The daughters of the Prophet, peace be upon him, were Zainab, who was married to Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi' who was her maternal first cousin. Ruqayya, who became a wife to Uthman ibn Affan, and Umm Kulthum, who was also a wife of Uthman ibn Affan after Ruqayya passed away. So he married two daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why he was called Zunnurain, Uthman, the Nurain, the one with double illumination of light. So the Nurain, because he was married to two of the daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When when Ruqayya passed away, he married Umm Kulthum. Then Umm Kulthum passed away, and that was during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet said, had I had a third daughter for Uthman, I would have 
given her to him in marriage. So Uthman had this merit of marrying two of the daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And finally, Fatima, who married Ali ibn Abi Talib, his first cousin. His grandchildren from Fatima were Al-Hasan, Al-Hussein, and Muhsin, who died as a baby, and Umm Kulthum. From Zainab, he had Ali, who died as a baby as well, and Umama, who got married, but she did not have children. And also from Ruqayya was Abdullah, who died as a child as well. So now all those who are related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they are classified from his descendants. They are either from Al-Hasan or Al-Hussein. Anyone who is now Sharif, they call him Sharif, from the descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that means his lineage goes back either to Al-Hasan or Al-Hussein. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had the opportunity to marry many women when he was younger, but he chose not to do so. However, in his later life, to help spread Islam through females to females and to reconcile between the tribes, he enumerated the wives. Not as some people who try to attack the Prophet وسلم, for marrying more than one, claiming that he was a womanizer. We tell them the Prophet وسلم, married Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid. She was a widow at that time. She was at the age of 40. And the Prophet was at the age of 25. The Prophet being the most handsome amongst human beings, from the best tribe at the time, from the best clan of Hashem, anyone would dream of having the honor to marry his daughter to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was also mentioned in the hadith that someone came to the Prophet ﷺ and offered him to marry his own daughter. And he said to the Prophet, I would like you to marry my daughter. She is such and such and such. He started describing her beauty, her health, to the extent that he said to the Prophet, she never experienced a headache or toothache. Imagine a girl, very healthy and beautiful, but the Prophet ﷺ said, I have no need of her. Because the Prophet was not chasing this matter. He would receive the revelation to marry a lady from this tribe, then a lady from an opponent tribe. By doing so, now they are connected in a way, so they look at each other as relatives now, because they have a kind of connection through the Prophet ﷺ, and that would reconcile between the tribes. So that was one of the reasons why the Prophet ﷺ married more than one. Not only that, we mentioned that he married 
Khadija, she was a widow at the age of 40 and he was 25. So had the Prophet been a womanizer, he would have chased the young ones. And he stayed with Khadija all her lifetime until she passed away. And by that time, the Prophet wasallam was 50. If one is a womanizer, he would take the opportunity of being young and he would try to marry many women during his young age, not to wait until he becomes over 50. So the Prophet was with Khadija only until she passed away. That's when he received the revelation to marry one from he and one from there. And there was one that was married to the Prophet وسلم, through an explicit verse of the Quran. And that was Zainab. Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِّنْهَا وَطَرًا زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا Zayd, she was married to Zayd until he divorced her. After he divorced her, Allah revealed this ayah to the Prophet. When Zayd divorced her, now we have made her a wife for you. With this verse, she became the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With this verse. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not chasing this matter, as we mentioned. Out of all his wives that he married, only our lady Aisha radiallahu anha was virgin from all of them. The rest were either widows or divorced. And that shows as well that the Prophet وسلم, married more than one for a wisdom. Not only that, people at his time, the non-believers, who were very keen to degrade the Prophet وسلم, and scandalize him, in any way possible for them, they never criticized the Prophet for marrying more than one. It was a common practice, but the Prophet وسلم, was allowed to marry more than four because the Prophet وسلم, is protected from being unjust to any of them. And when it used to be the time for our lady Aisha to spend the night with her, and that's the youngest, that's the only virgin wife he had, he used to ask her to pardon him so he can go to the graveyard and supplicate Allah Azza wa Jal for the deceased believers, to make dua supplication for them. Again, if someone whose heart is attached to woman, as they claim, he wouldn't miss such an opportunity being with the youngest and the most beautiful amongst his wives. And that shows as well that the Prophet وسلم, his heart was not attached to woman. So the Prophet وسلم, married Khadija bint Khuwaylid, then Sauda bint Zam'a, then Aisha bint Abi Bakr, that's the youngest, Hafsa, the daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Zainab bint Khuzayma, they used to call her the mother of the poor. She used to help the poor. Hind, Zainab, Juwayriya, Ramla, Safiya, and Maymuna, may Allah bless them 
all and raise their ranks. Also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had all his children from Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid, except for his son Ibrahim, who was from Maria. Khadija Maimuna and Al Qasim were buried in Mecca, and the rest of his wives and children were buried in Al Madina in Al Baqiya. So Khadija in a graveyard in Mecca now known as Maqbaratul Muallah. Al Mu'alla Cemetery. Khadija is buried there with her son Al Qasim, that's the oldest one. Maimuna is buried outside that graveyard in a place where the Prophet وسلم, married her. When she was feeling ill and sick, she asked to be taken to that place known as Sarif in Mecca and she asked to be taken to that place so she can die in that same place where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married her and what she wished happened she died in that same place and she was buried in it the Prophet وسلم, was initially breastfed by his mother, then by Suwaiba. Suwaiba was a female slave for Abu Lahab, for Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet. But Abu Lahab was one of the worst enemies of the Prophet ﷺ. He was one of his worst enemies. But when Amina, the mother of the Prophet, gave birth to the Prophet ﷺ, and he was born as an orphan, as we mentioned, Abu Lahab, the brother of Abdullah, meaning the uncle of the Prophet, and that was something people would do for even these days, to show a kind of sympathy. So he freed Suwaiba. He let her free. So she's no longer a slave. At that time, he wasn't aware of the status of the Prophet ﷺ. So he didn't know what the Prophet will be in the future. But as we mentioned, to show a kind of sympathy with his brother who passed away, and now his nephew, who was born as an orphan, he freed this lady, Suwaiba. That's all what happened. Later on, when the Prophet received the revelation, and he was ordered to proclaim the call of Islam to people at the age of 40, he went to the Mount of As-Safa, this mountain, and he called the people of Quraysh, O oh, people of Quraysh, and they gathered around him. And they used to call him the trustworthy and the truthful. He said, see if I were to tell you that an army, horsemen, an army of horsemen, are coming behind this mountain to attack you, 
Would you believe me? They said to the Prophet, all of them, of course we believe you. Because we haven't experienced you lying throughout your life. And they used to call him even before he received the revelation, the trustworthy and the truthful. Then he said to them, then bear witness that I am the messenger of Allah. When he said that to them, Abu Lahab, that's his uncle, was the first one to show enmity to the Prophet. And he said to him, may you get lost. That's what it means. You are calling us for this reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a full surah refuting Abu Lahab and threatening him with the severe torture in hellfire on the day of judgment. He said to the Prophet, Tabban laka. Now literally it means, may your hands be lost. Because one would actually achieve things and uh, he would be using his hands, even when selling and buying, trying to get earnings in this life, he used his hands usually. So the Arabs would say to a person, may your hands get lost, meaning you won't achieve what you look for achieving. So when he said to the Prophet, Tabban laka, that's the meaning of it. Ali haza jama'tana, you gathered us to tell us you are the Prophet of Allah. Allah revealed this surah. Tabbat yada abi lahab wa tab. Ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab. His money won't benefit him. What he earned won't benefit him, won't save him. Sayasla naran zat lahab. He will be admitted into a severe fervid fire of hell وامرأته, also his wife Ummu Jamil bint Harb Hammalat al-Hatab she used to collect the thorns and throw them in the pathway of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi jidiha around her neck habalum min masad like a chain of fire so Allah azza wa jal defended his prophet with this surah of the Quran. So Abu Lahab was one of the worst enemies of the prophet. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I grew up between the worst two neighbors, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt wa Abu Lahab. They used to throw what comes out of people on my door. So they were the worst enemies of the Prophet, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid and Abu Lahab. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyid came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was in prayer before the Kaaba. And he tried to strangle the Prophet والسلام, with his piece of garment he was wearing. Abu Bakr عنه, came and pushed him away. And he said, are you killing him just because he's telling you, I am a messenger of Allah and he's the one who brought you the proofs from your Lord? So he defended the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyit and Abu Lahab were the worst two neighbors of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. So Abu Lahab was not praised in any hadith. Rather there is a surah of the Quran degrading and threatening Abu Lahab and his wife with the severe torture he will be facing in hellfire on the day of judgment. So it is not true, nor valid, nor accepted in any way. And that's against the rules of the religion. To claim that 
Because Abu Lahab freed Suwayba, his female slave, upon the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then they claim that while he is in hellfire getting tortured, every Monday he will be given cold water to drink. And some may say he will be sucking from his finger cold water while he is in hellfire. And Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran in a very clear and explicit verse, لا يذوقون فيها بردا ولا شرابا إلا حميما وغساقا They don't have any kind of cold drink or any kind of drink while they are in hellfire except for extremely boiling water that they will be forced to drink from and when they drink from it the skin of the face will melt down. So it's a kind of punishment for them. That's in the Quran in Surah An-Naba. So Abu Lahab, his torture won't be eased while he is in hellfire because Allah Ta'ala as well said, لا يخفف عنهم من عذابها The torture in hellfire will never be lessened. So Abu Lahab will never have any kind of relief while he is in hellfire. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to keep us steadfast on Islam and to end our lives as righteous Muslims, righteous believers, Amin. and Allah knows best. We say La ilaha illallah and make salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.